This is Unit 8, Lecture 4, all about depressive disorders and bipolar and related disorders. Originally in the DSM-4, these were all grouped as mood disorders, but in the DSM-5, they have actually been split into two different categories, these two. And um, so the mood part is what is similar between them, but they have characteristics that make them warrant their own categories. We only have one learning target because at the moment our, our only job is to understand kind of the definitions of these disorders and we will get into treatments um, towards the end of this unit. Let's begin with major depressive disorder. Here are some statistics for you. It is highly likely, whether you realize it or not, that someone in your life um, has or will have some episode of depression. And that is because between 6 to 10% of the U.S. population is clinically depressed. And it is the number one reason people seek mental health services. So it is quite common. Um, to some extent, it is the common cold of psychological diseases, disorders, excuse me, because of how frequent it is. Women are two times as likely as men to experience major depression and a quarter of, uh, approximately a quarter of all females, all females will experience an episode of major depression at some point in their life. For a clinician who is looking to diagnose major depressive disorder, they're gonna look for a set of symptoms that last approximately either two months in someone that does not have reason to experience depression, or at least two months or more in someone that does have cause to experience depression. So like if you're grieving or something uh, terrible has happened to you to make you feel a sense of loss, it's perfectly reasonable for you to experience some of the symptoms I'm going to mention. Um, but for it to be going to the point of seeking, seeking a diagnosis, the symptoms would have to be a little bit longer, okay? Or would have to exist, excuse me, would have to exist a little bit longer. So overall, uh, there has to be either a depressed mood or a loss of interest or pleasure in almost all activities. So this is not just feeling sad for a long time, though that can definitely be a part of this. If we think of what a depressant, think back to like our studies of drugs and alcohol, and a depressant like alcohol slows down the body, slows down the nervous system. So when we say depression from a psychological uh, clinical point of view, we mean the whole body appears to be slowing down in some different ways. That does result in experiencing sadness, but that is not the only thing that clinicians are looking for. So what are they? Well, they're looking for at least four of the following to last either two weeks or more without cause or two months or more if there is cause. Marked weight gain or loss, constant sleeping problems, agitated or greatly slowed down behavior. There's that reference to a depressed nervous system. Um, fatigue, the inability to think clearly or feel like you're in a fog. Feelings of worthlessness or frequent thoughts of death and suicide. For someone experiencing depression or a depressive episode, they are likely to fall into this depression cycle. Um, <clears throat> Now the hard part, I'm going to list them in this order just for the sake of your notes, but really a person could, could fall into this cycle at any stage here. So someone might experience a negative stressful event, and then they might fall into a pessimistic ruminating explanatory style, or in other words, their thinking is really negative. I'll get much more into this in just a minute, so stick with me here while we get through the cycle. Um, they might then enter a hopeless depressed state, and then that may hamper the way that individual thinks and acts. So they might experience cognitive and behavioral changes. And through those behavioral and cognitive changes, it might um, make them experience personal rejection or assume that there's going to be personal rejection. And then that's likely going to lead to a negative stressful event and so on and so on and so on. So here's a little uh, graphic of an example of the negative explanatory style but let's talk about that a little bit more specifically an explanatory style in general is basically who or what we blame for our failures and so here are two examples um it almost it might be easier for me to walk through the example before i talk about the connection to depression so let's say here's a common stressful event um breaking up with a romantic partner in people that are not experiencing depression, they will likely, even though it's really sad and might even be difficult to get through, 
they deep down are likely to realize that this is a temporary experience. This is specific to this situation. Um, perhaps they might see it as an external locus of control, and then most likely they will get to a point of successful coping. However, explanatory styles tend to be um, extremely pessimistic and based on a lot of ruminating. So a lot of just dwelling on the same thoughts over and over again. And what psychologists have found is that for those suffering from depression, um, they often explain bad events as stable, global, and internal. So um, if we go back to our same example, breaking up with a romantic partner, someone who has depression may think of it as stable. This feeling will never go away. Global. It's going to reach their life far beyond um, this particular instance. Internal. That they did something wrong. And that not exactly leads to depression, but that is often an expl explanatory style with in someone who has um, depression. And depression-prone people respond to bad events in an especially self-focused and self-blaming way. There are also two disorders in the depressive disorder category that are a little bit less severe. Persistent depressive disorder was formerly known as dys dysthymia. Um, and yes, you should definitely know that term. And it is similar to major depressive disorder, but it's a little bit less disabling, meaning the person experiencing this type of dis depression is probably um, quite able to still go about their life but it is marked by chronic low energy and poor self-esteem. Um, it's somewhat of a low grade and longer lasting depression. In children, we might, uh, children might experience disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, uh, formerly known as childhood bipolar disorder. And this is where a child is irritable or angry all day and have temper outbursts um, approximately three times per week or more. There are various reasons or uh, explanations, causes of why major de de depressive disorder develops. Um, the psychoanalytical perspective would say that current day losses, so something that someone is experiencing now in their life, may evoke memories of negative childhood experiences or unresolved anger or conflicts, um, unconscious conflicts towards parents. Um, and then depression is almost like the body's manifestation of that conflict. Biological explanations would say that there is a lack or insufficient amount of specific neurotransmitters in one's brain so that it's a chemical imbalance and specifically referring to serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine with a large emphasis on the serotonin imba imbalance. The social cognitive perspective would compare it uh, very much to the reciprocal determinism theory of Albert Bandura that negative thoughts will influence the creation of negative behaviors, which will influence the situation that that person is in and therefore in turn influence a negative thought patterns. So this is where that depression cycle comes from. Um, that depression results from maladaptive interpretations of life events. So you're going to have negative thoughts if you're experiencing depression. And if you have those negative thoughts, you might conduct negative behaviors, making the life event that you are going through um, worse. And then you're experiencing that negative life event, you're going to have more negative thoughts. Next, we're going to move on to bipolar and related disorders. These are less common than major depressive disorder, but they are more disruptive to the individual's life, mostly because it is marked by um, alterations between uh, manic states and depressive state. In fact, this disorder was formerly known as manic depressive disorder. Um, so when someone who has bipolar disorder is in a depressive state, they're going to have many of the same um, symptoms of someone in major depressive disorder. They may feel gloomy, um, they may act withdrawn, have an inability to make decisions, um, experience great fatigue or the feelings of being tired, and have a slowness of thought. So still that depression of the whole body and nervous system. But in bipolar disorder, that person might also experience states of mania. And when they are in a manic state, they might experience extreme elation, euphoria, desire for action, hyperactivity, flight of ideas. And that's a tricky term. Basically, flight of ideas are when someone has so many thoughts, so many ideas that, and, and they're coming out of their mouth, they're explaining them at such a high rate that they don't seem to connect 
um, from one to the other, at least not for the person who is just listening to this person talk. And the thing about mania is that while it's a wildly optimistic point of view, it's often marked by poor judgment. So maybe reckless spending, um, fewer inhibitions when it comes to sexual encounters. Maybe that person experiences very little sleep. In fact, um, bipolar disorder, at least the mania stage, is connected with extreme creativity. Many great writers, poets, composers, artists in general have been known to suffer from bipolar disorder. But during their ma mania phases, their creativity peaks and um, they've come up with some of their greatest works. So people like Walt Whitman, Virginia Woolf, Samuel Qu Clemens, um, also known as Mark Twain, and Ernest Hemingway. Bipolar disorder breaks down into three specific types. Bipolar one is someone who's experiencing manic episodes and usually the major depressive episodes. So kind of what we just described. Bipolar two, someone is experiencing mania, but to a lesser degree, we call this hypomania. And it's such a lessened degree that the person might not even realize that they're having a problem, but those around them might be concerned about their erratic behavior. And it's still um, lasting, that erratic behavior may still be lasting um, about four days at a time. Cyclothymic disorder is hypomanic and depressive, depressive symptoms that last for at least two years, but never quite reach that major depressive episode or um, that full mania episode. However, within these highs and lows, again, that person may still feel fine, but they would still need to seek help because they are likely at a greater risk for bipolar one or two. The causes of bipolar disorder largely overlap those of major depressive disorder with a few extra stipulations. Um, one of those being a very, very strong biological predisposition due to family history. So in other words, up to two thirds of those with bipolar disorder can trace mood dis some sort of mood disorder in their own, own family history. There also appears to be some psychosocial factors in triggering new episodes or, um, or in preventing them, namely that stressful events often trigger manic episodes specifically. So another way to think about this is that when something stressful happens to someone who has bipolar disorder, they might kind of like rise to the occasion of facing that stressful situation, but they're going to overrise to it. They're going to respond too strongly to it um, and then experience a, a manic episode. Uh, looking at some scans of someone with, a bi with bipolar disorder, P uh, PET scans show that brain energy consumption rises and falls with the manic and depressive episodes. So you can clearly see that the brain does work differently in someone experiencing a depression and manic state. So those wild changes in the brain are likely related to the development of bipolar uh, disorder. Um, my slide is blank for just a moment as I give you kind of a warning that this is the one and only time um, I will be addressing su suicide. And the slide is really about how we can help someone um, who may be thinking about it. Um, I, I do wanna talk about it though because bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder are uh, potent predictors of suicide. However, I also wanna say that most people who go through this um, do, especially if they seek treatment, do regain their capacity to love, work, be successful, and um, manage their depression um, with the help of treatment. So what could we do to help someone considering suicide, um, especially as a good friend and listener? First of all, we could listen. We could uh, empathize. We could, we perhaps cannot sympathize, but we could empathize and offer friendship we could connect that person um, with a school psychologist, counselor, um, refer them to the Suicide Prevention Lifeline or the Crisis Text Line or other um, resources that are at our disposal. And then finally, we could try to protect that person, especially if the threat is imminent, and seek help from a trusted adult, a parent, teacher, school nurse, or a school counselor, or if um, immediate, certainly call 911. So thank you for this one, listening. This one might have been a toughie for some of you, but I hope you learned something um, that not only teaches you a little bit about psychology, but maybe helps you understand a very common uh, set of disorders.